Just, just. Oh man, let's oh, man. get it going, man. This is my world. This is world trying to get a nut, bitch. I'm Petey crack, crack. crack. With it. Come on. Come on. Shit, I'm a hug the corner till I get a truck quick. Put some dogs on it, have it performing the system going through the dog shit. I'm robbing back with Papa the demand, so don't ask my management why I'm popping next to men. I took proper procedure when popping the pussies. See if you was possibly prestigious And I could take you to Come that gang war chorus I'ma bang out orders And your brains laid out For them intern chorus This what PD say PD do PD crack out like AKA M-A-G The shoes keep a loose Ten times two The twenties dummy lace up the shoes Cop a dime of that watch The other demo for the booze This what PD say PD do PD crack out like AKA Magnum Brown The shoes keep a loose The two way like da 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 Petey Crack is a guy who I really feel like could have been the next big thing during his era. While some people might disagree with me, I really think that his charisma, versatility, unique style, and flow could have made him a big star. Some months back, I watched the Kanye Netflix documentary and Petey was getting a lot of hate because at the time, Rockefeller was focusing on him more than Kanye. People were calling Petey a bum on Twitter and also saying that he wasn't good, which I think think is very false and that's why I'm here today to tell the story of Petey Crack and why he was once regarded as the prince of the iconic Rockefeller records. But before I get more into the video, I would first like to thank you guys for coming to see this because you guys could be doing a million other things right now, but instead you're here with me and I appreciate that. If you guys like the content, you guys should like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Also, follow my Instagram too, that would be greatly appreciated. Comment down below your favorite PD Crack verse, song, project, etc. Also, let me know where you're tuning in from as well, especially if you're from Philly, represent where you're from. All right, without further ado, let's get into the video. P.D. Crack would be born Pedro Zayas in September of 1977 and grew up in North Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Growing up, P.D. dabbled in the street life and was very mischievous as a kid. Hip-hop was always around him growing up, and his uncle put him on to people like Public Enemy and LL Cool J. P.D. hated school and didn't want to do nothing else besides write raps. The rap group Tough Crew from Philly really made P.D. realize that he could do rap because they were from Philly as well. While in high school, Petey would be a part of a group called Ice City with the rapper Freeway who would later be in state property with him. Freeway's cousin, Indy 500, who has always been a frequent collaborator and friend to Petey, was also in this version of the group alongside Ty Nitty, who's the originator of the idea of the name of the group. He was Ty Nitty at the time, but later went by the name Hustle. Notice how I said for this version of the group because Freeway would later run with the Ice City name and dropped the project Welcome to the Hood with his version of Ice City which consisted of himself, Hydro, Face Money, and Bars. The relationship between Freeway and PD runs very deep and plays a pivotal part in the backstory of PD Crack. PD and Freeway would get locked up together with both of them being in the same drug program but ultimately PD violated this drug program. When it comes to Rockefeller, Freeway drew the attention first. He caught the attention of Beanie while rapping on stage at a club in Philly and Beanie told Freeway that he wanted him on the team as soon as he got situated. Something that I do know was that Freeway has said that he did rap for Jay-Z backstage at the Tyson vs. Bolta fight in Madison Square Garden which took place in January of 1999. Sometime later, Freeway was taken up to New York again with a bunch of other rappers this time and according to Freeway, when he rapped for Jay-Z this time, he ran out of the room and thought Freeway was just crazy. Freeway would have a warrant out for his arrest at the time and was on the run so he thought that he was about to get a record deal and then get a lawyer. As fate would have it, a week or so later after this, Freeway was back on the block in Philly and some cops pulled up behind him and his friend while Freeway was playing his demo for him. 
Freeway knew that he had warrants, so he got out of the car and ran, and then the cops caught him, and he would end up going back to jail. Once he got home, he was put on house arrest for a while, and Beanie was in California at the time and told Freeway how nice it was out there and how once Freeway got off of house arrest, he would be there right with him. Beanie stood true to his word, and Freeway's big introduction was on the song 1900 Hustler, where he had a crazy verse. He actually wasn't signed yet when he did that song because he still had to prove himself through various means, but ended up getting a deal with Rockefeller as we know. Mind you, this is all happening while Petey is locked up. 1900 Hustler would appear on the Dynasty Rock La Familia album, which would drop in October of 2000. People in jail knew that Freeway was a friend of Petey's and informed him about what was going on and what his mans was up to. While behind bars, Petey would rap battle people, but due to the lack of competition, Petey stopped going out to the yard to battle people. A man named Carmen, who Petey was cool with, pulled him to the side one day and told him that he should try to do something with rap when he got out of jail. Carmen was connected to two people by the name of Anthony and Louis Farlow, who Carmen said had a studio and may also would want to end up managing Petey. Upon being released, Petey was in a halfway house for about six months, but Carmen would call Petey Petey's grandma's house asking for him and he and Petey would link up once again and they would meet up with Anthony and Louis Farlow. Sadly, Carmen would pass away and at his funeral, Petey would see Anthony and Louis Farlow and they agreed that they should do something together. Petey would get Indy 500 and they were going crazy with the songs. This was a bit of a rebellious stage for Petey because Freeway was now involved with Rockefeller at this time and looking back on the situation, Petey realizes that Freeway didn't owe him anything. He realized that Freeway was in a position that it was too early for him to bring in anybody. Petey didn't have a lot of money at the time and was selling weed in front of a bar. 100 Hustler was out at this time and everybody in Petey's hood was talking about it. Petey began to get discouraged but the moment he cites that really put the battery in his back is when freeway pulled up on him in a tahoe and his mans honked the horn at him this is when pd said f the whole i city thing and it was now pd and indy 500 doing their own thing around this time is when pd would meet up with oshkino the old heads when pd was coming up was getting money with oshkino and sparks old heads and they used to have the artists battle each other everybody ends up rapping for a long time but it finally comes down to oshkino and pd because both had a lot of material Petey has said that he had a lot of raps due to him writing about five raps a day. Later on, Petey saw Oshkino on South Street in Philly and recognized him and they exchanged numbers to do a song. At this time, Oshkino was with Rockefeller and a part of the whole Black Friday thing. They would end up doing a song together called Want to Ride and when this song was released, Petey was going under the name Pedro Tequila. He actually says the name during his verse in the song. The reason why his name was Pedro Tequila was because because he thought that Tequila was Spanish since Petey is black and Puerto Rican. He was completely unaware of the fact that Tequila mainly comes from Mexico. As far as he came up with the name Petey Crack, it unintentionally happened when in a song, Petey said the line, they call me Petey Cracko like Benny Blanco. Benny Blanco being a reference to Benny Blanco from the movie Carlito's Way. That was a lot of people around him's favorite rap and he cut the O off of Cracko and that's how he got Petey Crack, even though Petey has said that he never wanted to glorify Crack or anything like that. But back to the song Went A Ride and it originally was supposed to be Petey, Oshkino, and a guy by the name of young Grant on the song who rode with Beanie at the time but young Grant Sally got murdered so they needed someone else to put on the song so they got Emilio Sparks who Petey actually didn't really like at first because he felt like he was little and had a very cocky and bossy attitude. The song would end up being played for Dame Dash, who was one of the co-founders of Rockefeller Records, and he really liked the song, and he wanted to meet Petey. A month would go by with little to no follow-up until Emilio called Petey, in which now they were cool, and Emilio said that they were out in Miami, and that everybody was out there, and Dame wanted to meet him. He said if Petey could get a plane ticket, they had a little apartment, and he could sleep on the couch. Petey had never been on a plane before, and the furthest that he's ever been 
and outside of Philadelphia was New York. It was Louis Farlow that helped Petey get his ticket and gave him a couple of hundred dollars before he took off for Miami. Upon making it to Miami, it was a huge culture shock for Petey because he was there in Tim's and jeans and blazing weather while people are all walking around in flip flops, tank tops, and the whole nine. But Petey would end up going to the studio and Freeway was surprised that he was there and it was a surreal feeling because Petey just came from the hood where he was watching guys like Jay-Z, Mariah Carey, Memphis Bleak, and Dame Dash on TV, but now they were all in his presence. Beanie put in a good word for Petey and Dame Dash asked Petey if he wanted to be a part of the Rockefeller family. Petey of course said yes because this was his dream and Dame asked Petey if he had a lawyer, which Petey didn't, so Dame told him to get one. Petey took his number down and for two weeks nothing happened again but about a month after the Miami thing Petey got a call from a lawyer and he ended up getting a deal. The contract was for $600,000 and he got $600,000 up front so he took it because like I said prior to the whole Miami thing he was selling weed in front of a bar so 60 racks was looking real good to Petey at the time. Petey got signed around 2001 as he said on the Flip the Script podcast. He was signed as a solo artist and the thought of putting him in state property wasn't there yet. Even though Petey was signed to Rockefeller, he still wasn't in the inner circles at the label and had to work to get in. He joined at a crazy time because by 2001, Rockefeller was booming. Cameron just got signed that year. State property was in full effect. Jay-Z was on fire. They had the movies, everything. Rockefeller vs. Nas, Rockefeller vs. D-Block, State Property vs. Major Figures. I mean, I could go on and on. It was truly a crazy time, man. Petey would get involved in the Nas situation with him rapping on the grinding beat with State Property members as one example. He didn't really want to go into the whole D-Block thing because he was a huge fan and a Jada kiss, but 2001 will be a crazy year, but 2002 was when Petey would start making moves. Him and Indy 500 would release the mixtape Crime Partners this year, and there's footage on Too Raw for the Streets of Petey doing an in-store mixtape release for the project with Indy. At the in-store, he said that by mid-2003 was when his Rockefeller album should be done at the time. Also in 2002, we would see the release of the classic movie Paid in Full, and on the soundtrack to that movie, we would hear the song One for Petey Crack. Now the original version of this song was done before 2002 and featured Freeway and Indy 500, but the track was a little different and catered more to their style. One day while performing in Philly, Petey would play the song and Cameron was in the crowd. Cam really liked the song and asked Petey if he could get on it. At this time, this was the biggest artist that wanted to get on a song with Petey. Next time Petey went to New York, he laid a verse and then Cam and Jewels would put their verses on the song and you can actually listen to this version on YouTube. Petey would go on to play the verse for Jay-Z and when it got to Cam's part in the song, Jay-Z told the engineer in the studio to delete it. Petey after this would tell Cam about the deleted verse and he told him not to worry about it and Cam gave Petey another copy of the song. Later on, Petey would play this song for Beanie Siegel because he was excited I mean, of course, he just got a feature from Cameron, who was hot at this time, but Beanie Siegel would do something worse than Jay-Z, and he would break the CD. But when asked why Beanie might have broke the CD, Petey said that he thinks that Beanie did it out of loyalty for Jay-Z at the time, and not really anything personal between Cameron. Cameron has commented on this situation and has said that at the time that the song was being made, nobody was really messing with Petey Crack, but Cam did and actually wanted him on Dipset and wanted to sign him, but Damn Dash didn't want that to happen because of the whole Philly Harlem thing. Obviously, we know that Petey fit in well with State Property, but let me know in the comments if you think that Petey would have done well with Dipset. I think that that would have been crazy with Cam, Jim, Freaky, Jewels, and Petey being the top members. But let me know what you guys think. Also, a side note is that there was also some friction between Petey and Jewels because Petey was drunk at one of Diddy's parties, <laughs> which, <laughs> yo... I ain't gonna lie, I, I wrote that in a script, but every time I think of Diddy and Party, and I think of the whole fabulous thing. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> but we gonna skip past that. But anyways, Petey was at one of Diddy's parties and he thought that something like wasn't like what it was. 
Petey was expecting to get a lot of love from Jewels because they were tight, but Jewels just gave him like a regular schmegular handshake and not like a handshake and like a hug like you like normally do to like your homies. But it ended up being cleared up like at the end of the day. But now with one for Petey Crack, there were some issues because Beans and I'm assuming members of State Property had an issue with Cameron getting on a quote unquote Philly record, even though Petey didn't even know that those people even wanted to get on the record. Dame Dash came to Cameron and said that they wanted to keep State Property on it and still have Cam, but get rid of Jewels, in which Cameron didn't like that. Do you remember earlier when I talked about how I saw the Kanye Netflix documentary? But like I said, I really wanted to do this video for a while, but after seeing the Kanye Netflix documentary like a while back, it really sparked my interest to continue on with this video. I vividly remember the part of the second episode in the documentary of when Kanye was at the video shoot for One for Petey Crack and Kanye was being told that he was the best rapper producer but did like that title and wanted to be held in the same regard as a rapper. Rapper. Petey was signed around 2001 and Kanye was signed in 2002, but the label at this time was backing Petey. At the time, nobody really had a clue how big Kanye was going to be, but the thing I really didn't like was when the documentary dropped, people were calling Petey a bum, among other things, and discrediting how dope he was. Obviously, we know that Petey didn't blow up to be like Kanye, but we'll get into necessarily why Petey didn't really blow up, but he 100% had the talent to be a big star and in the documentary it states that pd fit the image of rockefeller at the time more than kanye also in the documentary, it was anticipated that One for Petey Crack was going to be the record that really put Petey on the map and that Dame wanted his album ready. There were even talks of Kanye even wanting to go to LA to work with Petey. One for Petey Crack though, would release in the track is crazy and really shows off the skills of Petey. His choppy but precise flow, charisma, and star power is just evident. Mine and a lot of people's favorite part of the song is when he goes and the mat goes ring yo that just i don't know why but yo that just that's just perfect for me it just goes crazy i don't know why but he does like the gun or that kind of sound effect in a lot of songs i don't know i just like it in my opinion his upside was crazy and i do think that for one his name held him back he held himself back and he was also like a little bit ahead of his time which i'll explain later but one for pd crack would hit the streets and the very next month pd would appear on jay-z's the blueprint 2 the gift and the curse album on the track as one. 2003 would roll around and by this time, PD was fully in state property as a member. This year, we would see what would end up being the peak of PD's career with his appearance on Freeway's song, Flipside. But PD appearing on that song almost didn't happen. According to Just Blaze, who produced the track, he said that Oshkino was originally on Flipside but was yanked off. Flipside was originally a derivative of the song Rock the Mic, which appeared on the first State Property album. Flipside was also supposed to be the first single, but it didn't really exist in its current form until after they decided to shoot the video for the second single on Freeway's album called All Right. Pity Crack would be added to the song, and the rest is pretty much history. The video for the song was shot on the same block that him and Freeway were selling drugs on. Years later, Petey and Freeway are promising rap stars and their whole hood is proud of them and showing out for the video. This left Petey very excited and when they were about to start filming the video, Petey saw commotion in the crowd to only figure out that Jay-Z pulled up to the video shoot. In the song Flipside, Petey killed it once again with his very memorable verse and in the verse, he declares himself as the Prince of State Property who will soon be the king. Flipside would peak at number 95 on the Billboard Hot 100 and PD was gaining traction, especially in the streets since he also had his Crack Files series going on at this time as well. Unfortunately, what some people might not know is that PD would get locked up in 2003 pretty much right after Flipside dropped. I'm pretty sure this might have been on the Rock Army tour because this was around that time, but like I said earlier, while on Rockefeller, PD had been on the run and had been on the run for about three years to this point. What happened was, Petey was in a deep sleep in a hotel room where he was supposed to check out and the cops busted down his door to see if he was all right and they would end up finding out that Petey was on the run and arrested him. Petey didn't get out until about seven or eight months after this and by this time,
time, the State Property Chain Gang album was already out. The Chain Gang Volume 2 would release in August of 2003, with their peaking at number 6 on the Billboard 200, selling 69,000 copies in its first week. Petey has said that songs like G-A-M-E and Temporary Relief were meant for his solo album, but when he got locked up, he gave them a way to stay property. Those songs though are really good, and if those were the type of songs that were going to be on Petey's solo album, then it probably was going to be really, really good. Unfortunately though, 2003 would be pretty much the beginning of the end for Rockefeller. There was starting to be an obvious split with the heads of Rockefeller at this point, and Jay-Z was supposed to quote unquote retire with the Black Album, which released in November of 2003. 2003 would end up being the calm before the storm, because in 2004, Rockefeller would officially split. Before the split though, there's an interview PD did in 2004 with Smack DVD, where he talks about him getting locked up in 2004. 2003 and his plans moving forward. He talked about his album coming out in the summer of 2004 with the Men of Respect album coming out after that. Aside from State Property, Men of Respect was another crew Petey was in with members Oshkino and Sparks, and E500, Don P, Hustle, and Donnie Warbucks. In this interview, he also talked about how he didn't want to mess around with no super producers like Kanye or Just Blaze because he didn't want them to mess up his budget. Before I get into the breakup of Rockefeller, Petey would make numerous appearances on the Beanie Siegel mixtape Public Enemy No. 1, which dropped in 2004. He would also appear on the songs Gotta Have It, Get Down, Flatlines, State P Rebels, and Unfold. Gotta Have It and Flatline would eventually land on Beanie Siegel's album The Be Coming, which would be released a year later. Speaking of Beanie Siegel though, it would be at his trial for when he was fighting an attempted murder charge that Jay-Z would tell Petey that he dropped the ball getting locked up right before he was about to blow up. This confused Petey because he felt like he was only warming up at the time. But now to the breakup and in 2004, Jay-Z, Dame Dash, and Biggs sold their remaining 50% stake of Rockefeller Records to his parent label, Island Def Jam. Jay-Z was also named president and CEO of Dev Jam Records. At this point in time, I feel like everybody kind of knows what happened with the breakup, but if you want to know more, just watch my whole Rockefeller series, especially the third and fourth episode where I break it all down. Basically, the whole roster that was signed to Rockefeller had to make a choice. Do you want to go with Damon Biggs or go with Jay-Z? Beanie Cam with Dipset and some others sided with Dame. Dame also brought ODB's masters to his album, a son unique with him as well. The Young Guns, Bleak, Kanye and Freeway along with some others went with Jay-Z. This split pretty much affected pretty much everybody on the roster, especially State Property and the individuals within State Property. Also, there was some tension in State Property because people wanted to get on point with the business side of things, so they went to Beanie and he didn't really give them any answers. After the split, PD was considered a free agent and there was nothing about State Property in his contract since he was signed as a solo artist and became State Property. Dame Dash wanted to have a meeting with Petey, and Petey would then go to the meeting and noticed that some things were very off. He noticed that normally when he was around Dame Dash and his people, they would usually take shots of Armandel Vodka, but on this day, they were drinking out of the bottle and telling him to drink a bottle and kept on doing toast. Petey got drunk and then Dame Dash pulled out the paperwork and Petey said that he would only sign to Dame for the right price. Petey would then say a number and then Dame Dash offered him ten dollars to $15,000. Petey said that he used to make that amount of money doing certain shows. Dame would then call Beans to talk to Petey, but Petey told Beans that he wasn't getting enough bread from Dame Dash, so Beanie told Petey to take his Rockefeller chain off and give it to Dame Dash because Petey was wearing Beanie. Rockefeller chain at the time. Petey would then thank Dame Dash and Biggs and walk out, but someone would come out and say that Dame Dash added another 5000 on whatever he proposed to him, and Petey just ignored it. By complete chance, Petey's lawyer would run into Jay-Z after this, and they talked, and they set up a meeting for Jay-Z to talk to Petey Crack. At the meeting, Jay-Z said that him and Dame Dash had a meeting about where the artists were going to go, and Dame Dash sounded like he really wanted to have Petey, so Jay-Z let him have Petey. Petey ended up going with Jay-Z and kept the same contract that he previously had, and Jay-Z gave him $40,000 to complete his album. At a point in time, Petey was up to $900,000 in his budget since he signed. 
At Rockefeller this time, it was commonplace to use other people's budget, with Petey saying that if his budget was open and state property needed a hotel, they're using his budget, they're getting flights, rooms, all that stuff. But now in 2005, Rockefeller was moving in a whole new direction. In August of 2005, we will see the legendary Jay-Z, LeBron James, Foxy Brown, and Kanye West double XL cover. This will show off Jay-Z's, or in this issue, President Carter's cabinet of talent, and he still had the Young Guns, Kanye, Memphis Bleak, DJ Clue, Freeway, and Petey. Upon seeing the issue, you will see that Petey's name is changed to Petey Petey, and the reason why is for obvious reasons. The name Petey Crack isn't something that's very marketable and actually ended up costing Petey some endorsement opportunities. Petey has said that the crack of his name doesn't necessarily mean crack rock, but his lawyer advised him to change his name in which he really didn't want to do. People were calling asking Petey to do endorsements for things like Corona and independent clothing lines, but they weren't filling the crack part of his name. But nonetheless, Petey was looked upon as to be one of the stars of this newer version of Rockefeller and one of the first big things that he did post breakup was land on Neo's first single, Stay, for his debut album. Petey was in a meeting and Jay-Z's right hand man Tata said that he had a song for Petey and told him that he needed to do it now and then. Once again, Petey had another good performance, but the song failed to make the Billboard Hot 100. However, the next Neo single, So Sick, would blow up and reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. 2006 would come around, and Petey was talking about his album coming out, but it eventually never did, as we know. As to one of the reasons why his album never came out, Petey has said that when he was ready, the label wasn't ready. And when the label wasn't ready, he wasn't ready. He said that with everything else, he felt like him and the label had good communication but when it came down to his album things were very different Petey would call the label to speak to Jay-Z and he would get through but towards the end of his time on the label he couldn't even get Jay-Z's secretary on the phone but Petey was wilded out around this time he was in and out of jail on the drugs along with other things he would be released from his contract and one of the conditions was to not talk bad about Def Jam this reminds me of when on the song You Gotta Love It, where Cameron disses Jay-Z, he says that every time he disses the label, he gets fined $100,000. But Petey ignored this and was going at Jay-Z and his former label. Now there's this whole thing about this alleged camel face hunting season project that Petey was supposed to come out with around this time, which on Vlad TV, Petey denied this. He said that this occurred during when MySpace was a thing and someone made up the cover of Jay-Z's face being photoshopped on a camel from his Kingdom Come album. Petey said that he entertained it and posted it with the people asking him if this was a new project that he was working on, but it wasn't a real project that he was working on. I was reading articles from back in 2008, and it looks like people were anticipating this project to drop in September of 2008. This was allegedly supposed to come out under Amalgam Digital, which PD was now affiliated with after Rockefeller. In 2009, Jay-Z would say this about PD. I don't speak to Petey at all, cause he's a psycho. No, he's a psycho. That's what I truly believe. Not trying to be funny or anything. Jay-Z would also say this quote about Petey as well. It's difficult because I've done so much for them. I gave everybody a shot and everybody got a chance to sit at the table and make something. So whether you parlay that into something or let that go away, you know that's pretty much on you. So if I'm not doing anything tomorrow or the next day, you should be cool with that. In response to this, years later on Vlad TV, Petey said that he agreed with what Jay-Z said in that last quote. And he took responsibility when he wasn't giving it his all. But cutting back to 2000. 10 and Petey would say in an interview that he never came at Jay-Z. He was just setting the record straight for people who didn't really know exactly what happened. He said that that was the past and he was now focusing on releasing his debut album called Time of the Night. To my knowledge, this also never came out just like his debut album on Rockefeller, Prince of the Rock never came out. Something that I did want to mention on this video was that PD has addressed there being rumors that he joined the legendary group The Roots, which formed in Philly. PD would say, it's just that the public was always consistently seeing me on Roots projects, three Roots albums. I could go to Larry Gold Studios right now and just go in there and record something and just leave it there for Black Thought. He'll just lay a verse and it might end up on a Roots album. That's how most of them joints I'm on happened. They just came from songs that I left there. But essentially, we have covered the meat and potatoes of Petey's career. 
after Rockefeller, he did drop projects and was still very active. And even as of recently in 2021, he dropped a song called Sports Mode, which a lot of fans praised. And I think that this year in 2022, he still dropped some songs. But something that I discussed earlier as to some of the reasons why PD never popped are a multitude of things. One thing that PD has mentioned himself was that he feels like things in his career happened too soon. He's talked about just signing to Rockefeller and months later, he's already getting a music video shot for him. Blowing $900,000 of Dev Jam's money on flights, Moet, Cristal, Lobster, Shrimp, Steak, I mean like you name it. This is something that he attributes to Dame Dash because he said that he would just put the black card anywhere and let them ball out and this went on over the course of two to three years. He was now $200,000 over his $600,000 budget, but Jay-Z still opened up his budget back up for him to finish his album, which PD did the whole album in two weeks. This led to the whole when PD was ready, they weren't ready, and when they were ready, he wasn't ready, like scenario. But nonetheless, I really think that PD had all of the potential in the world to be a star before and after the Rockefeller split. Besides songs like Flipside, Stay, and One for PD Crack, he also has songs like fall back ring the alarm and chitty bang where you can see the potential that he had that's not even touching the state property work that he managed to do along with the crazy freestyles that he's done over the years i think despite how his career turned out he still managed to be unique and influential with people saying that he's influenced the likes of someone like meek mill along with other artists. Earlier, I did say that I think that PD was a little before his time with the style per se, but look at the climate of now and imagine if he was out today. Obviously, this era is way different, but Latin Trap is taking over and one of the biggest artists in the game right now is Bad Bunny, who is doing crazy numbers right now. You also got guys like Anuel, Ozuna, and Daddy Yankee, who is older, but should be mentioned. But these dudes are huge, and all of them have one thing in common, especially with Petey, they're Puerto Rican. I think if he was out now, he would be a big deal, and I think that his style would still translate very well, even today. But all in all, let me know what you guys thought of the video in the comment section below. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.